You are listening to Fanfare Tracks. Because of the following special program, Wonder Woman and the Incredible Hulk will not be presented this evening. Time to get all your Star Wars news in a single file. This is Making Track. Here are your hosts, Mark Newbold and Mark Wolcaster. That's not true. That's impossible. You're listening to episode 42 of Making Tracks, brought to you by the fine folk over at fanfortracks.com. I'm your co-host, Mark Mulcaster, and with me today I have the pleasure and the absolute honour and privilege to be joined by one half of the winning team from the Jedi Temple Challenge, Mr. Mark Newbold. Actually, my name's Braden. <laughs> get it, get it right. <laughs> I, I, you know, I had to keep that quiet for so long. In fact, so long I grew from being four foot ten to six foot four. So I really had to get my hat on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How are you, Mark? How, how's your week in Star Wars been? It's been very good. Victory suits me well. It's been good. It's been a busy. <laughs> it's been a busy week. Lots, <laughs> lots going on. Lots of messages congratulating me. Obviously, you know, it's a big deal. But yeah, no, yeah. it's been good. It's been very good. Lot, lots of news. Lots. Lots of uh, interesting things for us to talk about. So, yes, I've been a decent week. How about you? Yeah, been good, been busy, pretty much back at work, which is good, but not full time. So plenty of time to keep up with all the news and binge watching Star Wars and stuff like that. So it's all good. What do you want to crack on with? What do you want to start with? I think we should discuss uh, the crowning moment of my my Star Wars fandom, Jedi Temple Challenge, episode one, I think. Lots of interesting stuff happened in the show. We've got Ahmed Best back as, as the... The host as Keller and Beck, Jedi Master Keller and Beck, which is rather cool, connecting to his Attack of the Clones character, of course. Yeah, let's talk about that. What did you think of episode one? It's just a really fun vibe to it. I think I said last week, actually, I was just so gutted that they haven't done this earlier. Yeah. Like when I was a kid. I think I was really actually happy for how well it looked, how well it flowed. And yeah, I just thought it was a really good, fun, fun episode. Well, the series. Yeah, I mean, the intro's good, the music, I love the music, the music's really well played. Uh, just the vibe of it, like you say, it is, it's that adventure game, Crystal Maze kind of feel about it, you know, for kids, obviously, like Star Wars should be. And the kids, all the kids involved, I mean, they've released the first two episodes, third episode's coming this week, all up and full on for it, you know, really energetic kids, so they pick the kids all really, really well, especially, obviously, me. <laughs> It, it, it just looked good. I mean, even down to... I mean, I really love AD3, the droid. Mary Holland does the voice of one of the most sarcastic droids. She's got that L3 vibe about her, hasn't she? She she has, yeah. She's uh, She's got that nice, not too kind of snarky, yeah. but definitely gives some lip and uh, there's a few fart jokes in there as well, actually, which is quite fun. Fart jokes are always funny. George yeah, would tell you that. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and LXR5 as well. I've never seen a pastel painted droid and it actually kind of works. Yeah, that's what I thought as well. Um, I think I may have seen something similar. I think actually one of my good friends, Nick Harvard, may actually have one of those droids. Yeah. One thing I did think was really cool was the quality of the um, the CGI, the computer stuff with the ships and that, yeah. the kind of cutscenes and that of them kind of traveling to different planets. I thought that looked as good as as a Mandalorian and probably straight out of a Star Wars film. Really, yeah. it's just nothing really negative you can really say about no. the show. I don't think. No, you know, so. no, absolutely. It, it's up and busy and fun. If, for anybody who's hooked up and wound up about canon, it's not canon. It's fun set in Star Wars. But there's enough about it that it evokes some really cool things. And I noticed something on Twitter this morning. I thought I've got to make mention of it. When, uh, well, okay, we'll get to, we'll get something in a second. I won't step too far ahead. Obviously, episode one, you've got three teams of two kids. So in episode one, you've got Grace and Drake, who are good friends on the blue team. You've got Braden and Griffin, who are friends on the orange team. And they've got a brother and sister of Janiah and Tommy, uh, who all gave it their all. Janiah and Tommy went out in round one. Grace and Drake went out in round two. Braden and Griffin went on to the final. The orange team went on to the final and became Jedi Knights. Well done, me. Yeah. I'll never forget it. So, but the, the thing I really enjoyed was when they were invested as Jedi Knights. Keller and Beck, obviously Ahmed, did the dedication ceremony, if you like, and the words he used was, "By the might of the Council, by the will of the Force, you are now Jedi Knights." And that's basically what was said from an episode of the Tartakovsky Clone Wars, presumably two thousand three, two thousand four time, and that has been used in 
Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. It's been used in the Clone Wars. It's been used in other places. Something I'd never wasn't aware of and hadn't picked up on. I thought, what a great little link. Yeah, that is really cool. It's funny because when when they uh, well when Ahmed kind of says that. It sounded familiar, and I thought possibly it was something from a computer game. But to go back to Tarkovsky's Clone Wars, I think that's a real nice kind of nod to that series, which doesn't get enough kudos oh. in, in canon, really, does it? Totally agree. Yeah. Totally agree. I mean, we've been going back through on Fantha, we've been going back through some old reviews that I'd had written for my previous site, for Lightsaber. And for whatever reason, they never got published because I obviously 22 episodes of a season of, of The Clone Wars, the animated Filoni Clone Wars um, but for whatever reason all the reviews never got written so I never posted them so I've been going back and filling in the gaps and getting other people to write the missing reviews I'll be tapping you up for one as well mate uh, sure. and you know and as we go forward we'll probably try and just keep doing it on the site through seasons you know seasons two all the way through to season six because obviously we reviewed season seven my point being is when I was looking through old files and old uh, reviews that I'd done on lightsaber I found reviews of the Tartakovsky Clone Wars. And it just got me to thinking that, you know, these are, they're not considered part of the whole anymore, but there are elements of them that, that have, you know, kind of made their way. I mean, we all think of Asajj Ventress first in the Tartakovsky Clone Wars. Whatever happened to poor old Dirge? You know, that would yeah. have been interesting. But, you know, there's all these other little things. And, you know, you think it's a bit like the old Marvel run, which I know we were talking about briefly a few minutes ago before we started recording. You know, the old Marvel run, there's elements of that that get worked in like Valance, obviously, in the you know, in Bounty Hunters now and Target Vader recently, which I adored. We talked about that on Canon Fodder last week. It's all part of the fabric of Star Wars. It's all part of the canon, of course. It's it's there, it's part of the world. Somebody at Lucasfilm it passed their desk and they put a fabuloso stamp on it and said, Yeah, get it out there, you know? So it all goes through the mill. I really enjoyed this. It was more fun, way more fun than I expected it to be. I do wonder if after a few episodes we're going to change up some of the games. Otherwise, it's kind of very, very formulaic, yes. as you would imagine, for kind of a game show. But I'm just thinking back to like Crystal Maze, where you didn't always have the same kind of puzzles and games week in, week out. And I thought That's that true. might be something that they might need to just do just to kind of vary it up a little bit. Especially in the, the first round, because you've got those, when they're kind of trying to construct a lightsaber and yeah. you've got those three stages, I could see that getting a little bit, you know, same <laughs> over the course of the weeks, I think. But I mean, Ninja Warriors changes it up. Yeah, Krypton Factor back in the day, you, old UK show, that used to change it. Gladiators used to change it up. This, this looks and very much feels like a certain kind of Disney influence. Oh. You know, Disney kids kind of influence. And I think yeah. that is not a bad thing. I think it's really good to be able to kind of engage younger Star Wars fans in this way. It's all up positive energy, isn't it? And I, I enjoyed it way more than I thought I would. That is it. I think it really is important <coughs> for the kids to have positive yeah. reinforcement because as soon as they go back home and they log on to Instagram or Facebook or whatever the hell yeah. kids are now logging on to, yeah. they just get bombarded by negativity all the time. Yeah. So just for 25 minutes, there's somewhere that the kids can see that actually not everybody is a complete arse yeah. and not everybody's got an agenda. Then I think that's that's surely not at all a bad thing. And I think it should be commended. Originally, it should have come out, I think, October time on Disney+, Plus, mm. but they've released it early on Star Wars Kids YouTube, which is great for all of us, you know. And it'll end up on Disney+, Plus, so probably more people will see it there eventually than they will on the youtube channel you know to have a show like this a star wars show like this yeah you're right i, I look back and think 10 year old 11 year old me stood next to Braden. i was a chubby little thing then so i didn't look didn't look that much like him he looks more like me now than i did then that's for sure but you know it would have been incredible and i'll tell you what if this does well i would so be pushing for them to do an adult version yes slightly more ninja warrior but you could imagine jedi master challenge or something simple yeah. as that that would be quite fun kind of set it all in the star wars you know maybe add a bit more peril with like some stormtroopers or first order stormtroopers or something yeah. i think that would be quite fun there's scope you can do this for a wider audience for more adults yeah. as well as just the kids that's not a bad thing with disney plus you've got the option then haven't you you do it's all just a matter of what they see as being beneficial so it'd be interesting to see how well jedi temple challenge does on youtube first because that's very clear and easier to kind of track as how how many people are watching it and that's stuff true. like that and that's true the streamer services the date of who's watching it and stuff like that is masked a little bit it's hidden and it's always less easier to access and, and when it is accessible sometimes you kind of go well how much of a spin has the company put on that just to give the kids a shout out episode two sienna and zakai yep. who are friends purple team they didn't win peyton and page who are sisters twin sisters and the blue team they went out in round one bryson and addison who are also good pals the 
orange team, they went out in round two. But just to point out, Sienna and Zakai, who got to the final, the purple team, didn't win the final challenge, so they didn't become invested as Jedi Knights. So it's interesting that even though you get through to the final round, doesn't automatically mean that you're going to win and become a Jedi Knight. So I kind of like that, and the, what, the little conversation that Keller and Beck had with them, sort of explaining, you know, I sense the dark side in you, you need to go away and train a little bit more, you know, just laying it all out as to why they didn't win. Again, it's a good lesson for kids, isn't it? I think so. We do seem to be slightly in that world now where everyone's a winner. Yeah. And and let's be fair, not, not everyone is going to win the first time that they try something so it would be quite nice to see if they get another shot at it later in the season just to see if they kind of come back yeah. and have another crack lightsabers look cool so yes they did i wonder yeah. if i can get away with an application for season two You'd if probably I can just away. on the higher end of the height restrictions maybe but you, you should be able to get in i got in true you did yeah i just don't know if i can actually remember all that information i have to in the second round when they have that story uh but they they <laughs> listen to and it's like how many ewoks were quibbling oh, about I yeah don't know. what what color clay was the dragon made out of and all that yeah as one gets older the um the memory is not as good as it used to be one final thing uh, frank oz is the voice of yoda kevin scott the author did some of the work on some of the the stories that the kids are told and sam whitmer is the voice of the dark side so there's some really good connections in there as well definitely a production that has um really kind of doubled down on making sure this can be as authentic as possible i think hey man it's me kevin smith a star wars fan fan the tracks fan so earlier this week the ea star wars twitter account posted up a teaser for an upcoming trailer that's going to be released on monday the 15th of june and this is going to reveal some more details behind the star wars squadron game which is meant to be the next game from ea it was previously mentioned or rumored to be called project maverick from what we've we've now seen there with the key artwork it's now called star wars squadrons mark did he get a chance to look into much of this uh, what's your thoughts on it my thoughts is anything like sort of x-wing versus tie fighter or any of that era of LucasArts games and it gets me in the cockpit of an X-Wing up and flying and shooting things down which is always my favourite thing to do whenever I play Battlefront then I'm happy with it as we were looking into this you know, there's not a lot of info out there I mean we've, we've, we're hearing rumours that EA have made it and it's an online monetized game so there's going to be microtransactions presumably to build up your ships and get more equipment or whatever it may be that you re- are required to do so it's going to be that kind of level up game and you have to pay to do it that's fine if the, you know, the transactions are reasonably priced I know EA have had issues in the past with with monetization in that respect but if it is a pure flight sort of flight sim fight game and it gets us out there flying and into battles and into missions and you know if you're a pilot in the alliance or in the resistance or however or wherever they set it and hopefully it's multi multi multi-era fingers crossed then you know you start off on sort of basic you would presumably start off on reasonably basic missions and you'd work your way up you know if you're working your way up to the battle of scarif or the battle of endor or the battle of yavin or whatever then you've got something to pitch at something to aim for the battle of jakku that might take us to places of mexico exactly places in history that you've seen but you've not seen all of it battle of tanab or i don't know you know just places that Mm. you know you could really investigate stuff that's been sort of peripherally or, or loosely mentioned that's not really been expanded upon hugely i think there's some great options to to do something very special but personally i really hope it's like it is that sort of x-wing tie fighter sort of vibe because i i was nuts about those games back in the day Ah, uh, yeah i mean to be fair me too tie fighter and x-wing yeah. landed right at this the perfect time for me i must have been about 14 and it was just uh, the amount of hours i spent in the cockpit was yeah. just crazy and i mean what's quite exciting is the hint that by the looks of things you've got the option of flying x-wings a wings, Y wings, U wings, yeah. Tie fighters, Tie bombers, interceptors, silencers, and just about every other iteration of like Starfighter. I think we've seen. I wonder if we see a Z a Z ninety five headhunter. Oh, that'd don't. be quite fun. <laughs> oh yes, please. Yeah, I yeah. know. So don't don't tease me with that. It's funny because actually I really didn't get into the Starfighter battles in um, Battlefront. It just didn't kind of land for me yeah. very well. No pun intended. I don't think. <laughs> um, and I, I don't know why. I think it was because it, it always felt like it was a bit of a a secondary mission because obviously the, the main thing was for, for ground battles but if they can expand on that yeah. that would be cool the, the microtransactions is is kind of a way that a lot of games have gone in some respect it will probably be a combination of upgrades and cosmetics and the problem is and the danger is not necessarily for me and you but 
possibly for the younger audience is that it can sometimes be a bit of a gatekeeping exercise when like you know you're closed off to certain enhancements because like you've either got to pay for it or yeah. you've just got to put in like you know a serious amount of flying hours in, in the game you know they, they did come under a lot of flack from Battlefront 2 for the way that transactions were working and the amount of hours you had to put in for that so hopefully they've learned the lessons and also it's easily done i i've got two teenagers who have quite easily rinsed credit cards <laughs> on fortnite skins and stuff if you give them a chance so parents i, I guess just kind of keep an eye out on your on your paypal accounts and that if you suddenly find you get lots of like 295 type transactions you probably know where it's going to come from and they soon add up don't kids they are star wars fans it soon adds up do you know what they do yeah they really do because like you know you think oh, i was only 295 and then it's like well that's five quid and then it's like you know it's almost a tenner yeah. and the thing is you know for the pursuit of skins and stuff like that I've never quite understood it and this is going back to a lot earlier games yeah Personally, I don't mind paying for actual upgrades which are going to help me with the game. But when I'm paying two ninety five just for a cosmetic skin, I'm kind of like, well, maybe I don't necessarily need that right now. So I suppose it's, it's down to each player. If, it, if it's going to be online, it's going to probably be a similar layout, I would think, anyway, to Battlefront 2. It kind of suggests then that there's not going to be a story mode. So it's probably just going to be... Straight up like, shooter. Straight up, yeah, yeah just like pvp it's just fine and that's it's not a problem as long as as long as there's some chance that you can kind of get a bit of flying hours in before you know before you kind of yeah. hit the, the, the battles that's that's the main thing so as long as there's a nice robust training area just so you can kind of hone your skills and stuff and hopefully also there's some kind of vr expansions on this as well because the vr for battlefront 2 and that was awesome that's true i really think space battles and, and flying in cockpits and stuff is really it's it's brought to life so much more by by having a vr headset we shall see let's see what um monday brings and then we could all be wrong come monday evening but it, hey. it'd be funny wouldn't it it could be completely not what we're expecting it could be yeah. it, it totally it could actually be another item versio storyline yeah just set with um with squadrons or a bit like alphabet squadron if if there's a story mode then something like that you could have maybe a, an imperial defector who yeah. defects from imperial or vice versa yeah or, yeah now that would be even more interesting but i don't think we've really seen no. a rebel defector defecting back or defecting to the the empire that would be something quite interesting and would certainly blip everything on its head so it would be interesting because just going off on a tangent briefly one of the things in in star trek at the moment is that there's a lot of investigation of the federation and are they as good as we think they are and when you actually look back through 30 plus years to like early next gen episodes there's some real shady stuff going on that's really been out there in plain yeah. sight but you kind of think they're they're definitely the good guys and in star wars with the rebellion there's been increasingly you know, some of the comics that came out, you know, when you had the one where there was a rebel prison, which I totally didn't get. But nevertheless, you know, no. there's lots of shades of grey. There's got to be, you know, if you look at it as even-handedly as possible, the Empire are the government and the, the rebels are the terrorists. They're the resistance against yeah. the government. So they are essentially freedom fighters stroke terrorists. It's that very grey area of stuff. So they're prepared, more than prepared. Like in Deep Space Nine, Kira would have gone in as a you know, to set bombs and blow people up. And there's that kind of, it's a very questionable moral ground for everybody because they shouldn't be in power because they stole the power. The Empire stole the power. So it's it the biggest con ever in the galaxy, wasn't it, which we saw in the prequel trilogy. So we, we as the viewer knows that, but the government, the people of the galaxy don't know the details that we do. They didn't see what we saw. We had the hidden cameras that they didn't. Yeah. You always hear that, you know, General Maydeen was in the Empire and, and this guy was in the Empire and Biggs joined the Empire and then he defected on the Rand Ecliptic and all the stories that you heard, that at some point somebody high up in the re rebellion would go, you know, you guys are just as bad as they are. Every bit as bad and ruthless and, and devious. And look at Cassian at the start of, of Rogue One, you know, the, the guy that's given him all the information that's it's a good friend. We're hopefully going to see yeah, him. Terrific, the, yeah, yeah we are going to see him in the Cassian show. Okay, he's in a bind, he's in a situation. The guy's going to get captured and tortured for information they cannot allow to get out. But Cassian does it, you know, and, and you could look at that if the shoe's on the other foot, you go, what a snake, you know. But actually, perspective makes you realise that he's done the kindest, safest, most sensible thing for the bigger picture. But, you know, you can look at all the these angles from different perspectives and yeah you're right it would be interesting to do a story mode where it's a high ranking rebel alliance officer actually goes I'm sick of this I'm, I'm going to go back to the empire or I'm going to join the empire or whatever it would be really interesting when we've kind of focused on for 
rebel alliances actions and stuff you, you look at um, what they've kind of done is they focused the real extremism mm. on um, Saw Gerrera there's these kind of conversations in the comics about where everybody knows that Saw is, he's got his own mission and he's got his own morals the partisan um, rebels the partisan rebels exactly yeah they're, they're willing to go that extra step and not really worry about collateral damage when they yeah. take out these targets and stuff it's all certain point of view isn't it yeah. um, at the end of the day when you think about it 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 wasn't necessarily the full empire that was pulling the wall over the galaxy. It was the emperor. Yeah. And then you kind of go, at what point does that trickle down to a level where actually it's just people yeah. in the military just following orders? Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see, like you said, we could be completely in the, going off in the wrong tangent thinking it's going to be like X-Wing versus TIE Fighter or whatever, which is personally, again, like I say, that's what I hope it is. I, I'm really hoping for a game where, like you just said, there's some sort of dojo where you can learn flight training, get used to the controls, go and do a few practice missions in, in Universe Simulator, and then they go, right, you're off on your first mission. And, and you start to build, build, build to the degree. And I'm not a big gamer, so I don't know the full SP on how it all it sort of levels up. But hopefully that you can play to a fairly decent level of involvement without having to put your money, your hand in your pocket. But then if you really yeah. get into it and you want to get that faster, faster engine, better lasers, better flight suit, whatever, you've got the option then to do it but you're not in completely inhibited. You can you can be involved in a great battle, but just know that you're riding around Silverstone in a Robin Reliant, not a Ferrari. On your head be it. Good luck, kid. You know, <laughs> yeah. if you want to last yeah, longer, I mean, then you you know, you've got to upgrade. Yeah, I mean I can remember one thing that they did really well, I thought anyway, with the old Republic MMO was um when you went into PvP matches, what would happen is you would be capped. So if you were like level, I don't know, five the highest that you could fight against would be somebody who's like level 15. And everybody's kind of abilities would be kind of maxed out at that point so that it was more level because there's nothing worse than you're level four or five and you go up against a level 50 yeah. person in a PvP and you just get like owned like that. You know, as long as they do kind of stuff like that. And I think they did that with Battlefront. I'm not really sure it really mattered too much. No. A lot of the, um, the weapons of Battlefront you ended up getting from kind of doing you get a kill streak and stuff like that and so you do these kind of tasks a new blaster would become your reward and some of the blasters were more more powered than the others but if you went into battle with just a standard e11 you could do all right and as long as the, the enjoyment is there you know and and also actually i think then the maps need to be wide enough so you can kind of do stuff like you know if, there, if there's an asteroid belt but you can kind of go and land on a on an asteroid yeah and, and do the whole kind of thing like um, Django Fett does yeah. in Attack of the Clones yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm excited. I'm very excited by this. Let's see if I'm going to be disappointed or not in next week's episode. That sounds like a plan. Let's see how disappointed you are, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, and you are following Fanthatrax. We are at the penultimate episode of the first season, hopefully there'll be more, of Disney Gallery The Mandalorian, and this episode talks about the music in an episode called Score. I don't know about you, Mark, I thought this was one of the most interesting episodes out of all of them, because the music of Star Wars is so important and so so key to everything that that happens on screen, pulls everything together. What did you make of this episode? Yeah, I'm with you. I really enjoyed it. I was pleasantly surprised, at least from memory. Every time I've ever seen any behind-the-scenes kind of videos about composers and that, I always left feeling, well, that's a really stuffy, slightly technical profession that is really difficult to relate to. I've always felt that when I've kind of watched stuff on like Hans Zimmer and, and even John Williams, even going back to how we explain stuff in the original trilogy. But with Ludwig Göransson, he was just really down to earth and really relaxed and I think made it really accessible for, I think, anybody to kind of understand the intricacies of, of composing. I thought it was a really strong episode. He comes over as a, just, just as a nice guy and an easygoing guy and, and someone who's got all this crazy talent, I mean, an Oscar winner and, you know, all the stuff that he's done and all the different types of music he's worked with. He's worked with Donald Glover, so there's another nice Star Wars connection as well. And just how easy that that talent comes out and how accessible, like you say, accessible it is to the people he's working with. You know, you see that scene on set, I think it will be episode four, the Bryce Dallas Howard episode, where he's there and it's the first time they've heard the music, you know, and you can see how excited Favreau is and he nailed the vibe of the show so well. And when he's seen with the recorder at the beginning, it's like, you know, as soon as I saw it, it's like, that's a recorder. You know, and he's got all that half yeah. a dozen different types of recording. When he plays it on the big bass recorder, it's like, good grief. Never would have thought. And then that wall of 
of tech he's got that just looks like something out of a 70s sci-fi film. I just thought that was I hilarious. Was, I was going to say, I, I say I thought he was kind of auditioning for Emerson, Lake and Palmer, to be fair. <laughs> you know, I mean, fact, all that simp stuff was crazy. And I think, I think actually what is, um, it's actually something that is complements the, the series in a whole is this mixing and combining of traditional score with the electronica side of his compositions. Yeah which is a bit like what they've done in the actual live action stuff with the, the CG and the volume yeah. and all that, where they've kind of me- melded all that. This is kind of like, it feels like this is kind of like a, a meeting of two slightly different um, genres. It just works so well. I mean, I think the Mandalorian theme is one of my favourite Star Wars themes, like hands down. Yeah, it, it's, so. it's funny how, I mean, we post the review on the site every week and Ross made a really good phrase he used, he re- referred to, the music of the Mandalorian as the audible soul of Din Djarin's character in the live action series, which is a really good way of phrasing it, you know, because I can't imagine the music of the Mandalorian being anything but this. And Ludwig says it, and Filoni and Favreau say, you know, it kind of would have been easy to go down the, you know, that sort of route. Not to knock any previous Star Wars shows that have done that because it's what you would do. Why would you not want to use that? It's like, you know, Current Superman movies not using the John Williams Superman theme to me seems like ridiculous. Why wouldn't you use the Superman theme? It's the Superman theme. I'd say my favourite Star Wars score of the last since Phantom Menace is John Powell's score for Solo. I think Solo is a phenomenal, monster underrated mm. score. How that didn't get put forward for an Oscar, and I know it was a an error. Somebody in the office didn't tick the right box, sort of thing. It should have been put forward, and it wasn't. Solo should be the first Star Wars film to win an Oscar since Jedi. My point being, amazing score, I wouldn't change it. That being said, because Solo and The Mandalorian kind of occupy the same areas of the Star Wars world, that underworld periphery and that sort of part of of what's going on, I'd love to have heard Solo with a score like this, a bit more rootsy, a bit more rustic, a bit more, like you say, it's a mix of stuff. And that's a great point you make about the volume and, you know, Bill George making a live action Razor Crest and filming it on a, on a, on a track. And obviously Hal Hickles just talked about it at length on the show. So go back and listen to those episodes if you want, you know, and all the stuff that they merged together to make the visuals work. It's exactly what you just said. You've got an 80 piece orchestra and then there he is making all these wacky weird sounds on his 70 synth. It's just brilliant. I think the John Williams score is from an era that's very romantic. The whole saga up to that point it has got that kind of romantic feel about it. And I don't think really, bar in chapter four, there was probably any space for that kind of um, romanticism in the score. Good point. It's, um, there's like a beat and a pulse behind the theme, which kind of almost makes you think like he's always on the move. It's the littlest hobo. Yeah, exactly. And it's Wolf and Cub and yep. all that kind of stuff, yep. which makes sense. And so I think that's one inspiration is is that lone warrior feeling. And and like he says in in the gallery, you don't see his face, your expression. So you kind of have to get that emotion through the music. So you get that, you, you know, when he climbs up and he's trying to learn how to ride a blurg and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. So it's the one episode that has taken me most by surprise, partly just because I didn't really know what to expect. Obviously, when, when you say a name like Ludwig Göransson, you kind of think of a Mozart, somebody who's yeah. kind of like a little bit kind of crazy in that. And yeah, he just kind of came across as vibing stuff out as well. Like you're saying, you know, I would just kind of play around with some of his stuff. And I can remember my, my brother had like a synth and we used to play around with that back about 10 years ago. And, and yeah, you'd come up with all loads of crazy stuff, but the most difficult thing was actually recreating that crazy stuff if you didn't hit record. I was trying to remember actually what, what did I press and yeah. what did I patch over and stuff like that yeah. all that stuff you can just do that on a laptop now there's vst pa- uh, patches for pro tools and pendulum stuff like that so you can actually do all that in the software but actually doing it physically again it's it's, it's quite nice and it kind of brings it back it harkens back to like the, the ben burke kind of era of yes. sound design and stuff like that yeah so. it did feel more like sound design than music in a way didn't it at parts I think that's kind of part of what he's kind of doing. He's he's building the atmosphere. Yeah, um, totally. The well known phrase now is John Williams brought the oxygen to Star Wars, and and in, in a similar kind of way, Ludwig is is breathing some kind of life and rhythm into the Mandalorian. It was just a, a good natured, enjoyable episode to see the smiles on on the faces of him from what he's created and from the creatives, you know, Filoni and Favreau specifically just hearing that music and and it does it's like you say star wars without john williams isn't quite star wars if you had a different soundtrack 
it wouldn't be the same thing. It just pulls it together. And he's one of the pillars of Star Wars, John Williams, obviously. Goranson has done something so different but no less Star Wars. It hasn't got. It's not that romantic storyline yet. It's a great point. It, and you know, Solo's got the Kira romance. You know, there is a romantic element to start to Solo, for example, which is why it might not have worked to the same degree. The John Powell score is just perfect for that film. But I'm just curious the underworld aspect. But like you say, you know, him being the lone warrior on his own, essentially with Baby Yoda and the child or whatever, which has apparently got a name. Now we're going to find out in season two, you know, just, just that journey. It's got that moving, you know, whenever you see Mando walking across the landscape and that music's playing that sort of Rocky style violin music, because it's, it's got that feel about it, at least to me, just fantastic. So yeah, this is absolutely one of my favorite episodes of the show. And we've got one episode to go, which we'll talk about on the next episode of making tracks. So that's it for episode 42 of Making Tracks, where we have literally talked about Live the Universe and everything. If you want to be a part of the action and stay updated on all the latest Star Wars news, visit Fantatracks.com or check out the Fantatrax app through the App Store to follow us on your mobile device. You can reach out to us and send in your listeners' questions. Didn't have one this week because we knew we'd got a lot to talk about with Jedi Temple Challenge and Star Wars Squadrons and episode 7 of Disney Gallery, but uh, we will have more questions very soon, so send them in. Email us radio at Fantatracks.com. Comment, like, and share on any of our social media feeds at Fantatracks be sure to subscribe leave a review preferably a five star one please on apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, spotify or your podcatcher or smart speaker of choice thank you again mark and we will speak again next week i reckon yeah i'm off now to dust off and power up my old 486 to see if i can get a copy of x-wing and give my old joystick a bit of a tug and see if we can get things flying again give that joystick a good tug and we will speak again next week take care <laughs> 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 there you go. That's the name of the episode, then. Coming up next on Fanta Tracks Radio, it's another episode of Making Tracks.